good morning again. Thank you all for coming out. Um, my name is Nikki Monroe. I am the environmental horticulture agent. Hi, Lee! Hi, Nikki! <laughs> and Master Gardener Coordinator. It is always nice to see a familiar face in the crowd. Lee is one of my volunteers, and she has been known to show up when I need one face <laughs> in the crowd. Um, she, she always puts herself out there as tribute. So this morning, I would like to discuss butterfly gardening with you all. It is a very important item on the agenda for a lot of countries and various regions in the world because we are having collapses of pollinator colonies all over the place. And of course, we had some alarm bells being sound about the monarchs. Pollinator gardening is not something that we had to really, really think about years and years gone by because people just planted all sorts of things in their yards and these animals were served, right? Nowadays, we have less and less diversity causing, and we have more and more encroachment on the areas where pollinators would naturally exist. So we have to mitigate that sort of damage. That is one of the reasons why I am doing this talk today. I believe that we all can have and utilize our very small opportunities to provide for wildlife. It is one of my favorite Florida friendly landscaping principles. I think it is very important that we garden more mindfully to remember that we coexist with other things that are living. And chances are wherever we just put our home used to be theirs. We cannot say that they are pestiferous. We cannot say that they are more of a nuisance than they ought to be because we invited, their, we invited ourselves into their territory. So let's work on figuring out how to live with various things, all right? Now, that said, that was my lead up into if you invite one, you have invited them all because everybody eats somebody. <laughs> that is how this works. So if you have butterflies, if you have bees, you're going to be feeding somebody that eats them. This is not <coughs> something that you want to do if you are not inclined to have a variety of critters passing through. But they will pass through. They will not remain there. And that is an important thing for you to remember as well. Identify what it is that you think is happening before you go and treat for it. Black racers, they will not eat you. They will scare the crap out of you. But they will not eat you. All right, they, they tend to just be like, oh, she's here and they start to run away and they startle you. But they will not eat you. They, they're not interested in your big toe or your ankles. All right, so be careful. Know what it is that you're dealing with. That's not rain, that's leaf drop water hitting us. It's a lot better than what dropped on me last week. <laughs> But, oh, it must have been. <laughs> All right, so be prepared for that. Another thing to think about is if you are butterfly gardening correctly, you're going to have water, you're going to have shelter, and you're going to have food for these butterflies. Food. They're going to eat it. Some of your plants are going to look tattered. They're going to look abused. And you are going to feel so successful because that's what they are there for. So if you have fennel, it will not be this cute. This is one of the plants that you are going to put into your garden and it's going to look like it has been terrorized. And you're going to pat yourself on the back because that's what it is there for. Now, if you have jatropha, if you have firebush, Porter weed, 
they're gonna still look super cute for you because they're nectar sources. That's another kind of food. So if you don't want beat up leaves, do not plant a host. But you're only going to get occasional traffic coming through from adult feeders. They're not going to stay. They're going to leave because you have not given them a place that they know their offspring will survive in. So if you want various cycles of butterflies in your landscape, then you're going to have to put down hosts and nectar sources in order for them to remain. All right, they will, they will do that. And um, all right, so I want you all to look at your publication. There are really, really great tips that I'm going to talk about. But for right now, I want you all to look at page four. All right, so page four in your publication, it gives you a table. All right, it gives you a butterfly species type. And there is a lot of information on here. Here are the two most important things for you to note. Regions. We are in region four. All right. We are in region four. So all of the butterflies that are in, that overlap into region four, there is no group of butterflies on here that says only found in region four. So you just have to highlight those. That's what I did on my publication. I went through, I highlighted the butterflies that should be found in my region by region, all right? And then what I did was, because I'm a bad person, I highlighted the ones that are here all year. Those are the ones I'm gonna focus on. Everybody else who wants to come through and, and do what it wants to do occasionally, they'll get the leavings. You wanna provide for the ones that are here all year. Chances are their needs overlap. You wanna do this efficiently, you want to do this effectively. That is the whole point of you coming to this talk to find out how to get that done, right? Less trial and less error. All right, so I also went over to flight season, which means that's when they're here. Doesn't mean when they're leaving, it means that's when they're here. And I highlight it all year, straight on through. The whole of table one, I highlighted the regions that cover mine, and all year. So now I know what butterflies are going to be here all year in my region, all right? Now the next thing on that table is what are the larval host plants? It's gonna be easy for you to read that part. It's gonna be easy for you to figure out what feeds the adults. It's usually, it'll usually say nectar plant. So most flowering plants will have some sort of nectar, all right? There are some that do better than others. And then you're gonna say, and then there are things that, there are some butterflies that'll feed on rottening food. I put out my peach pits. I put out my apple cores, right? I don't cut up a fruit salad and stick it outside for my butterfly garden. I give them what I've, le I've got left over because I'm a miser and I like to recycle in that way. And then when the butterflies are done with it, I throw it into my compost bin. It can work. Your banana peels, they will eat those up as well, unless you've got some other thing that you're doing with banana peels, all right? Um, so these are things that are very, very important. Habitat, yes. So I put them in a little bowl so that they can ferment all together because the butterfly is really, a lot of the butterflies that feed like that are feeding on the fermented product from the fruit. So if you keep it in a little bowl, they'll be able to go ahead and get it. But I put it in a shallow bowl, a shallow dish. Um, I usually just put it in amongst the other flowers on the ground. It won't, it won't really... And no, it does not cause pest problems. The ants don't want your rottening fruit. They don't want it. They don't like you for putting out vinegar. 
they're not going to be keen on that spot. Um, another thing to think about as well is when you put your little water plate out there, put a little bit of soil in there, put a couple of rocks in there, because they will tip over and drown if you don't. That's number one. Number two, they will get minerals, especially from our very sandy soil. Our soil is more of the large mineral com component than s smaller particles of soil would be. So you just sprinkle a little bit of soil into the pan, you put a few pebbles in there, and then you fill it up with water. In the summertime, you need to change that out at least three times a week. Because all sorts of yuck will incubate in that little pan if you don't. Same thing with your bird baths. And besides that, this is Florida. Mosquitoes are this big or that's how they feel. You don't want water sitting around for more than a few days at a time, right? So it is very important that you go ahead and, and put yourself on a schedule at least every other day or every two days, get them flushed out. Make sure that you are doing that. And you know, birds that are sick don't know they're sick. Butterflies that are sick don't know that they're sick and they're all coming for their water. You don't wanna share that, okay? But you do wanna have a clean water source. They will stay if you're providing them with all three of these things. So shelter is usually the same plants. They will just hide in there. They'll fly around in there. They'll perch here and there. And they will stay as long as you've got those three things. Now back to our table. Um, you're going to identify the butterflies or the plant and figure out what butterflies go with that plant. All right. But it is a lot easier to go by butterfly you're going to find something likable about most plants if you're inclined to do any gardening at all. You're going to find some redeeming quality about those plants. Um, I got a question the other day, why don't we have the really, really, really pretty butterflies like they have down in Brazil? We're not Brazil! <laughs> but we do have some beautiful butterflies. The zebra longwing is a black and white majestic thing. I mean, it will float your boat, right? And they have cute caterpillars. I wouldn't suggest you go playing with them, but they're cute enough. All right, so please remember that we are not Brazil, but we do have some beautiful, beautiful butterflies. The American Painted Lady, it's got that gray and that blue under the wing. It's got that brown and orange on the top. And of course, we've got mangrove butterflies as well. They've got that little bit of orange and brown thing going on, and they're beautiful as well. So select your butterflies and enjoy them when they come into your yard and encourage other people to do it as well because, well, we need the help. It's important. All right. So butterfly species overall that are found in Indian River County are, of course, varieties of swallowtail whites and sulfurs. Big note on whites and sulfurs. If you are doing any vegetable gardening at all, don't put your cabbages and your kales or anything in that family near your butterfly garden. You will not be happy because their larvae want nothing more than to sit down in the cores of your cabbages. They will be so pleased with the expansion of the butterfly garden that you just put in, and you're gonna be like, that darn Nikki told me. I'm telling you from now, if you've got cabbages in and they're following your tomato crops that you want pollinators for, you need to keep them a few feet away you want to make sure that they're in a completely separate bed, all right, so that you don't have this overlap, this crossing, okay? So be very careful when you select your plants. Yes? I just put in a um, orchard. Yes. It's about half an acre mm -hmm. of 
Mexican, Central America, South America fruits. Uh huh. How far away should these be from that so all the leaves, plants, and everything, the fruits don't get attacked as much? Okay, so if you are growing citrus, yeah. then you want to be aware that. <clears throat> Let me find which one it is to make sure. <laughs> there we go, the swallowtails. They will look like drops of bird poop on your citrus plants. That's swallowtail cats. And they will eat down the leaves on a citrus plant. That said, groves that we have are not overly affected because of the way that they, that they, that they manage their production. It's usually small homeowners who invited butterflies into their landscape that end up having a bit more of a problem. Mm -hmm. I recommend that you manage your tree. You, you take care of its nutrition. That's what I would say that you should do for that. Or plant an alternative type of citrus into your butterfly gardening area. Or give them something to sacrifice. Give them something else, okay. something as tribute. Citrus isn't doing all that well here right now anyway because of greening and canker. That's why I stay away from it. Well, there you go. So you're not going to have that much of a problem at all. <laughs> when manage your fruit drop from whatever it is that you're growing, because then you do have some mature adults that are going to go there and feed off of the, the rotting fruit on the ground. So you just take the rotting fruit, if there's any on the ground, and put it where you want it to be. And you should be fine. You're going to have more of an issue with flies than you're going to have with butterflies or bees or anything like that. All right? Okay, so let's talk about what makes a butterfly an insect. I have a picture of an ant. This is the velvet ant, actually, because it does a really great job of depicting it. Well, not this picture. Let me find the other one. Oh, wow, I skipped this whole thing. All right, so butterflies, moths, and skippers are three different insects that are Lepidoptera, right? But we see something flying around with big wings and we call it a? Butterfly. Yes! The difference is, the most overt difference is in the way that their antennas are, all right? So butterflies usually have this little thing out here that looks like the little antennas that we put on children and we pretend that they look like bees. <laughs> Skippers have a little hook on the end of their little ball on the antenna. And moths don't usually have that. They have weird looking eyebrow like antennas. They have weird looking bushy eyebrow antennas. All right. Now, let me show you all the color picture. Oh man, the ladies in the print room are going to totally laugh at the fact that I did not get these laminated. So this is a velvet ant, but it's a really great picture of a velvet ant. And I'm using this picture to show you a great example of what makes an insect an insect. These three segmented parts. Now some of them will have more of a waistline than others, but they're still going to have a head, a thorax, an abdomen, and a, and a, and a thorax, right? That's, that's what they're going to have. Three pieces separated, okay? And then they're going to have six legs coming off of that abdomen, of that, oh God, save me and the queen. All right, so they're going to have three legs coming off of the middle. Even if you can't see that that's where the legs are connected, they're going to all be connected from the middle. Sometimes it looks like the legs are connected from down here. They're not. Pulled enough of them apart. <laughs> Look, they are ugly. I didn't want to be messing with them any more than, I, than they wanted me messing with them. So I was like, okay, if I've got to do this. So you can't kill anything efficiently unless you know what it is. The art of war, right? Know yourself and know your enemy and you'll win all the time. Only know yourself is 50%. Only know your enemy is 50%. But when you know both, 
You are in business, and I know one thing. I'm going to kill them if they're ugly. <laughs> Spiders are hard to kill. Who knew? <laughs> they're not insects, though. They're, uh, they're arachnids. Guess who don't like nothing with eight legs? Guess who stays outside as often as she can? <laughs> it's bad. It really, like, it is so bad. But anyways, so going through and doing this very efficiently. Let's see if I can decimate this one set of really pretty handouts. Because I made these deliberately. So this is the Gulf fritillary butterfly. You will find this here year round. Isn't it pretty? It's a really nice bright orange. Can you imagine this flying over your green? Yes, really, really standout plant, um, standout butterfly. Now, itty bitty eggs, we're not gonna worry about them. That's the caterpillar. Don't touch that caterpillar. That caterpillar is telling you, don't touch me. Leave me alone. Right? That. You bring them in. Yeah, you bring them in. Put them in a cage. Grow them. So, so the, the, you wasps know, they're, don't get yeah, them. the wasps are all over them. I can't, no, I can't allow it. He, he. I won't, I won't allow it. <laughs> we won't allow it you if know, I see it. He spends like two hours a night out there finding <laughs> eggs and bringing them in and hatching them and raising them. <laughs> And this is the pupa stage. We call it Maypop. Um, this gorgeous thing here is the larval host. I have a person who brought me their passion flower vine because they got ticked off, dug it up, put it in a container and said, here, you can have it. I am tired of those caterpillars eating my passion flower vine. <laughs> of course they're going to strip it. They think you're nice. But it all came back. Of course it comes back. But you see, this individual planted that vine for themselves. Don't ask me why. I have a plant science degree, not a human degree. Oh, the shade. All right. Now, we all know that the magnificent Atala is on its way back. We thought it was extinct up until a few years ago. Then it was found, the caterpillars were found on Kunti. West out there in Felsmere. And now they have even expanded their range, their even into Brevard County. They're not supposed to be up where it is that cold. We're hoping and praying that the colonies that are further south will keep on surviving and that we will be able to take this off of the list. But at first we thought it was completely gone. Now, what you're not seeing from this flattened picture is the underwing. And it has little whitish, bluish, and orange dots on it. It is just magnificent. It's about this big though. It's about this big. And I couldn't find an uncopyrighted photograph of... I like my paycheck coming to me. I need it. My smallest child is now six feet one. I'm not complaining because I used to tell him, don't let me have to sell you at a discount. I was awful. I was an awful parent. You should have heard what I said last week. All right. This is another very popular butterfly here. This is the cloudless sulfur. It likes peas and beans and things like that. It will not decimate your crops. This is a, this is a picture of partridge pea. This is a beautiful little plant. It has nice feathery leaves. It has beautiful little yellow flowers that, and it does bloom in abundance. And you will find this butterfly 
and this plant flowering year-round here. The two of them don't ever give up on one another. And a lot of times, if you plant something for a butterfly that is here year-round, you're going to have flowering year-round. You're going to have whatever that plant provides year-round, except for when they mow it down. And then it comes back, and then guess what? It'll flower again for you. That's how this works. Okay? I normally deliver this talk on a PowerPoint on a really big screen. All right, so this is the giant swallowtail. It truly is giant. I've seen pictures where people have it in their hands. Talk about a handful or two. All right, so this is the giant swallowtail. Isn't that pretty? That is really nice. All right. That's what the giant swallowtail cat looks like. Poop! Bird poop! That is its superpower for surviving. Who, like which predator is going to say, oh, that looks delicious? <laughs> if only they knew. All right. And swallowtails can be citrus pests. The larval hosts are darn near anything that is citrus. Okay, now all of these butterflies, once they mature, they don't really feed that much. They just dip around from nectar. Their one job when they get mature is to go reproduce. What a life. <laughs> all right. Now, see, when I worked at the radio station, this would have been dead air. All right. So now this is the zebra swallowtail. This is another one that can be found here year round. Isn't that pretty? Now, I'm wearing a blue shirt today. For the past four years, my sons have been on a campaign that says, Mom, black, gray, brown. You need more color. Went out the other day and got navy blue glasses and I says, oh look, got navy blue glasses, isn't this cool? And they're like, no mom, that's another shade of black. Try again. <laughs> but this is not another shade of black, but they say it is another shade of gray. Can't win. But this is a beautiful black and white butterfly that I am currently pretending that I cater to in my yard. Now you tell me, isn't that the cutest caterpillar ever? You would not believe that that bright green thing, the little blue on top, turns into a black and white butterfly, but sure enough it does. See, everything has something interesting about it. You just gotta figure it out. Can you see that? If I tell you all the fights that I had with these pictures yesterday, it ain't right. All right, so the larval host for these butterflies is the pawpaw plant. They don't have to grow super big. It can be put into a corner of your yard. And many, many people don't eat the fruit. They use it as feed for their butterflies. This plant grows very well here. It is usually found in hammocks. It's usually found in native spaces without any problems. It has a small, small sipping straw. So butterflies have proboscis that allow them to eat. They don't have mouths proper. They have something kind of like what an elephant has that they stick down into it. It's called a proboscis. It's basically a sipping straw. Okay. These butterflies have small ones. So if you're going to provide flowers or something for them to be able to eat, you need to provide flowers that, are very sh that have very shallow cups. Now there are some flowers that have more of a tube 
that are good for hummingbirds and, and other butterflies that have longer straws. But these butterflies, in order to keep them in your yard, you need to have flowers that have shallow cups. So, lantana has shallow cups. Pentas have shallow cups. All right, they have very small, shallow basins where their nectar is held. Those butterflies will survive in your landscape as long as you've got them like that. All right, doesn't matter if I've got that turned around. Won't be pulling it back. All right, now, zebra longwing. What's fantastic about the zebra longwing? It's another great big butterfly. It is also the state butterfly. This is our butterfly. Colorful, dark green, sunshiny Florida has a black and white butterfly. I love the irony of it all, believe me. I get completely tickled at this. But this is the zebra long wing. I thought this with the tips of blue and the little streaks of red here and there. This was the best thing about this butterfly. It pretends that it is boring. But you know what was exciting way back when? Black and white TV. <laughs> Thank you. It stays true to its caterpillar. Right? No surprises there. And what are these caterpillars on? It likes the pawpaw shrub, if it can have it. And it'll eat the passion vine to the bones as well. Right? It does like firecracker. Isn't that nice? <laughs> All right, and they have short proboscis as well, so you want to be careful with how you feed them, okay? But yeah, the zebra longwing is the Florida state butterfly, so if you are going to have any real success, bound to get those. And the one that I was talking about a little earlier, she's pretty fantastic. American Painted Lady. This makes you sit down and say, well, that brown and orange is pretty nice. But that underside, that's why she's called a painted lady. <laughs> yes, a lot of color. A whole lot of color. Isn't it amazing? Hi, that whole adage about judging a book by its cover. This is her cat. This ugly little critter here is her cat. And then sometimes they'll come out green or brown when they pupate out. But that amazing looking butterfly comes from all of this gobbledygook. <laughs> and the American Painted Lady is quite the interesting chick. Cudweeds is her favorite thing in the world to eat. You're hardly ever going to find it. But if you can put daisies or any other kind of aster, Stokes aster, daisies, anything in the aster family, you will be providing a host plant for the painted lady. Isn't that something? I tell you. All right. Black Eyed Susan? Yes. Okay. Black Eyed Susan is one of my favorite host plants. Got a bunch of them for one of my projects. All right. So the monarch, the queen. <sighs> the viceroy who likes to pretend. Um, and then there is also a soldier butterfly. Yes, we stuck with that theme, doggone it. All right, so we, were first, we first received our alarm bells about butterflies 
losing habitat and not migrating properly and all that jazz when we had issues with the monarchs, right? Their migratory patterns were being disturbed and the areas where they used to go to were developed in, in all the countries, not just in Mexico, not just in the US, and not just on the borders of Canada as well. It was everywhere that they went. Whole entire areas, by the time they got back home, were developed. That's a problem because we didn't put anything that they had lived on back in place. It's not a problem for human beings to develop an area. The problem is when we don't remember what that area used to be and what it used to provide for. I will not ever tell you all that treehouse living is for everyone. That's nonsense because you're still negatively impacting that tree, right? I'm not encouraging anyone to play Tarzan and Jane. What I'm encouraging us to do is remember that we are encroaching and to mitigate that damage. That's what I'm encouraging us to do. So that's the monarch larva, that cute little striped thing. It is not delicious. The reason why it's not delicious is because of what the monarch feeds on what the caterpillar feeds on, gives it the ability to make its predators gag. Like it is nasty, all right? And from the first time that they eat that caterpillar, they're like, oh, never again. And this beautiful thing here is a monarch chrysalis. Doesn't that look like a piece of jewelry? It looks like a pendant, right? That is so beautiful. So it says herbaceous plants, milkweed preferred. Milkweed is nasty. I will not explain how I know. It is nasty. But monarchs, queens, viceroys, soldiers eat it like there is no tomorrow. One of my volunteers says to me, well, Nikki, I found out the other day that once they eat down all of the leaves, you can cut it back and it'll spring back up again. Yes, you can. Because they're not going to be eating the stalk. They're not going to be eating the stem. They only really want to predate on the leaves. So you just trim that back. Try not to cut too much of it off all at once. And it'll start to give you new growth and it'll start to leaf out for you again. You just need to stress it into doing that. Stress is good. Not too much stress, but stress is good. Some stress is good. All right. Now, the Viceroy, who is the pretender to the throne. Oh, and I showed you all his picture. That's the Viceroy down there. <laughs> He's got this black marking down in here. And he's more red looking. But he pretends so that everybody who has ever thrown up on a monarch will, will think that the Viceroy is just one of those nasty butterflies. He isn't. He's pretty delicious, I think. Don't know that. We have no story to tell on that. But he will eat a willow. Which makes you think that all that salicylic acid might make him not too yummy either. I'm not sure. I just know he doesn't get eaten because he pretends. He's a great actor. Probably raises his eyebrows up and is like, you intend to eat me? How dare you? Do you know who I am? All right, now his adult food is rotting fruit. There's always something to do with your trash. If you make it. All right, now I, I did talk about there being moths and skippers. So let me show you all my favorite skipper. And of course, my favorite skipper is my favorite skipper because I've seen him so much. The reason why I've seen him so much is because he eats grass. 
This is the fiery skipper. That's the female. Oh, the levels of shade. That is the male. I think that it really is only our species that got it right. And that's the underside of the female. Look at him go on that blade of St. Augustine grass. Now let me tell you all the truth. Fiery skipper should not be able to kill your grass. It shouldn't. If your grass is growing healthy, fiery skippers and you will get along just fine. If you have grass that is unhealthy, if you have grass that does not have enough blade to support itself, then you're gonna have problems with fiery skippers if they are there in abundance. They're not generally there in abundance either. I'm showing you this skipper so that you can recognize it if it's in your landscape. I'm not showing you this because it is truly a huge pest to grass. I'm just giving you all one of the wonderful reasons why grass is a magnificent plant. And there's no reason not to grow it efficiently, sustainably. If grass floats your boat, I'm here to help you row it. Honestly, grass is not the enemy. We have got to stop blaming that innocent, innocent plant for how we mismanage it. It provides a service. One of the skipper's favorite treats is St. Augustine grass. Bermuda comes in a close second. All right, so if you've got grass or if your neighbor has grass, now is a wonderful time to go home and say, oh, look at you providing for our pollinators. And you're just doing it so effortlessly. This is magnificent. All right, so there are a lot more butterflies that we can grow here, that we can, well, we can provide for here. And I couldn't give you all pictures of them. I couldn't give you all rundowns of them because you know, there's a time limit. We have the Florida Museum. That's UF's museum. We do a lot of really, really great work and research there. We curate so much amazingness that I wandered in there for a half a day that I had off while I had to be in Gainesville. It was not enough time. I only stayed in the butterfly section. Half a day. So now you all know why I give these talks with notes, all right? They have an online database that you can go on to and it'll ask you, what county are you in? And it'll show you the pictures of the butterflies. So if you use that publication and if you don't feel like Googling each butterfly separately, or if you just want to se select by look of butterfly, this is a great resource. So I put the link in here, but honestly, you stick Google Florida Museum wildflower and butterfly database, click, you're bound to get it right. There is only one of those. All right, but it is a great resource. I didn't steal my pictures from them for three good reasons. Two of them is because there are some people who have donated materials to them that are not hours. So I have to be careful about that. But we have done a lot of research and it's being curated there. So when they say to you that there are 47 different butterflies that you can find in our county, you are guaranteed to find that 47 butterflies. Maybe not year round, but at some point in the year you are going to find those butterflies here. But I really want you all to think about getting yourself a host plant, getting yourself a nectar plant, 
having your water. If you are going away, go Gators. If you are going away, turn down your dishes with water. It is best that you not leave water out than to leave water there and it is going to become polluted, okay? It is best to tell your butterflies, I'm on vacation for the next two weeks, you're on your own. They will make it, they will. They're resilient enough, they will find another source. And then when you come back home, you set back up shop again. Yes, ma'am. They do drink from ponds. So by the pond next to my butterfly garden, I don't need to add extra water? Not necessarily, no. And there are things in that pond that they can perch on and drink from. You're welcome. Now see, I have a little water thing to the side of my house that my son is supposed to be maintaining. I have a couple of pots turned over to raise up a platform, and I put addition to that for my butterflies. There are ways. We human beings are very, very smart, and we will get things done if we really want to. What time is it? Oh, good. See, we're on track. All right, so let's go back to our publication because I don't like contributing to the death of trees if we're not gonna use it efficiently. So there's another table. Um, I think it starts on page 22. Yep. These are your most likely plants to help you provide for who you want to provide for, okay? So it gives you the common names of your plants, at least what is more commonly used in your area. It gives you the scientific name so that when you have a problem with it, I can send it to the lab and they'll know what we're talking about. And it gives you flowering season information. I want you all to consider your enjoyment of these plants. Flowering season is important, especially if you're a snowbird. I've got people who are like, well, I want to grow mangoes, but I won't get any. <laughs> there are mangoes that will make when you are here. And I've helped people find them and figure it out. That's my job. It's a great job. Now, who's going to eat the mangoes for real? Squirrels, birds, or the human beings growing them? I'm not getting into that fight. All right, that's not my job. <laughs> All right, so lots of them, you'll see that a lot of the trees will flower out in the spring. And don't forget that we can take some of the suggestions for South Florida as well, because we are a southerly central county all right so you'll see that there are some things down in table eight on page 30 on page 23 that we actually grow very well here now pick choose don't refuse look at the plant that you intend to put in to make sure that it is suited for us try to err on the side of caution two out of three boxes can be checked off and you'll have a better likelihood of them doing well here. All right, wildflowers are very important because they do a lot of double duty, right? Our native bees are not necessarily bees that colonize in trees. They're not high up there. They're usually in the ground. So you wanna grow things that are gonna have some flowers that are lower down. We put in a demonstration area over at the Gifford Museum a few weekends ago. And after we planted a few things that were prostrate with flowers, within the hours, the two hours that we were out there, there were native bees going after them. 
And of course, we had a few very small children who came running to me. You won't believe what I just saw. I saw a bee. It looks like a bee. Is that a bee? And that was amazing. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. If you plant it, they will come. They hadn't seen those bees. And that was the most important thing. It's always good when you can get that instant gratification. You will get that if you make a plan to receive it. All right. So these are important things. You want to have a little bit of each. You don't want to have too much of one and not enough of the other. Try to have some balance. Always try to have at least 10 different plants growing in your landscape. Sometimes that's hard, sometimes that's easy. Um, if you have restrictions, I recommend that you, you can grow a butterfly garden in a pot. I've done it in a 12 inch pot, I kid you not. I used a four inch saucer for my puddler a four inch saucer for my puddler, for my water. I put parsley, I put porterweed, and I put dill. It can, a 12 inch pot can support four or five plants in peace. So you can do this on a balcony. You can do this on a terrace. You can butterfly, you can provide for pollinators in various ways if you choose to. Now, my favorite thing in the world that I've been promoting is community butterfly scaping. All right? That is when you and a few of your neighbors collude to give pollinators a huge area where they can feel happy, where they can feel as if they're welcome and there is enough food. You want to try that out even if you live in a condominium, you can have four balconies with containers that are providing for butterflies. You all can discuss putting containers in common areas. I'm not recommending that you all go out there and break up the soil and do all of that because that might be a lot more work. That might be a maintenance nightmare, but containerized butterfly gardening, you can get that done. You can seed them out, you can buy them here inexpensively. However you produce your plants for that container garden or that space in general. There are lots of communities that have these gorgeous walls that are not doing a thing anymore. This is a way to revitalize that entryway. This is a way to make that wall be more useful, right? And it's going to be visually captivating. So if you all have a few spaces in your community that are not taken yet, and you want to draw someone's eye to your location, this is a great way to do it. And besides that, it really does encourage community. And I think that that is something that is sorely missing. And I think that we can develop more networks down here by doing things like this together. Um, you want to start small, okay? An oak tree is a great space. It already provides for lots and lots of insects. It already provides for various moths and skippers already. So you just want to add a few nectar sources underneath an oak tree. Plumbago with the bright blue flowers is a great plant for putting underneath oak trees. I know that most of the time you see it out there in full sun, it will survive under part shade. And isn't that an amazing bright green and super light blue color to be up under an oak tree? Root interference, not a big deal. You're going to make yourself a little space, you're going to put in your one gallon flumbago, and it will take off in no time. You don't want to try to plant a three gallon plumbago because then you've got to make space for a three gallon plant. If you put a one gallon plumbago underneath an oak tree, you have made a plant to succeed. And it doesn't have to be right up against the base of it either, right? You can put it out further where it truly is in part shade. And plumbago will bring you the cute little cassius blue butterflies. 
look kind of like the flowers that they feed on. Isn't that cool? Well, that's the thing. There are many, many creative ways. And then, you know, we get the questions in all the time. What do I do with all that shade? Nothing grows under it. It's not pretty. How do I make this more of an attractive thing? I can't cut down the tree. Decorate it. Put some plants that are shade tolerant or part shade tolerant underneath it. You know what's really beautiful green that provides for pollinators? Wild coffee. It has a deep green leaf. It makes you sit down and say to yourself, wow, that's a lot of green. And it does very well in shade. Its sweet spot is part shade. So you've got plumbago that spins around. It's a four foot round mound. There were two of you that looked surprised. Plumbago does not really grow upright in a rectangle hedge. We will never win that war. If we put that plant in a place where it can grow up and mound over, we will pay less for our trimming and we will get more of the blue flowers that we're asking it for. Because it will get to the point where it says, I am nutritionally sufficient, I am producing enough food, now I can flower on out. What you're gonna end up with is a really beautiful light blue cloud. That's what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to be a fluffy light blue cloud. Who knew? Because I'm a plant scientist. I know these things. All right. So there can be a lot of barriers to the ways that you get your gardening done. But there are always ways that we can overcome them. All right. We have master gardeners. The program is funded by your tax dollars. University of Florida is a land grant institution. We are here for the sole purpose of addressing the issues of people in Florida. If we've got a problem with water, that's what I was hired for. All right? If we have a problem with how we develop our youth, every extension office at least has a 4-H agent for that particular issue. We are here. You pay your taxes. Come and ask us questions. Come and say to us, I'm trying to do a butterfly garden in four feet. What can I put in there that I can get the most out of? I have answers for you. Master gardeners have answers for you. We're funny. We're creative. We're curious. They act like they don't have anything better to do, which is really awesome because I'm here to take up their time. I really, really am. They're a wonderful resource. They'll help you sit down with a sheet of paper and say, this is your four foot box. Let's put some pentas in over here. Let's get you a couple of host, larval host plants over here. What are you trying to host? That can fit in another square foot. And we'll take up these two square feet with something else. There you go. And it'll be efficient. You'll come in another time and say, well, I got bored with those. What about these in a four foot spot? They like wrapping their minds around these things. We have high quality, well-trained master gardeners, half of whom I did not train. So I'm not tooting my own horn. I met them that way. And then I had to keep up the standard. The bar was set. All right, but I am encouraging you all to use them as the resource that they are here for. Busy Bee does a great job of marking pollinator friendly plants. They, they do a great job of marking the plants that provide for birds, a great job of marking the plants that provide for butterflies. They do a fantastic job of making your life easier when you come in here to shop. That's a great thing. I want you to think about your space. I want you to think about your time that you're going to spend managing this space as well. 
I also want you to think about your overall enjoyment and your ability to look at it. Put it in a spot that you can see, but you don't always have to be tinkering in. Because remember when I started my talk, everybody eats somebody. And if you're feeding one, everyone's going to show up for your buffet. Nature does not discriminate. You're going to have birds. You're going to have bees. You're going to have butterflies. You're going to have frogs. You're going to have snakes. You're going to have things that eat. Everybody eats somebody. So I want you to think about that as well. If you all have, if you all are hosting smaller people who are very curious and adventurous, and you know that you have robust access to bees, you want to put your garden out of their way. Because we don't ever always know who is allergic to bee stings until they get stung. We don't always know that. But I want you all now to be mindful of these things, to think of these things. If you have a little bit of a problem, but you're being very kind, I want you to think about where can I put it that I can see it, but it doesn't have to touch me. There are lots and lots of things to consider. There are some plants that provide for pollinators that have thorns. And the first talk that I ever gave, and I said to people, if you or someone who spends time with you are on blood thinners, and everybody looked at me like, I'm not the Debbie Downer in the room. Okay, I'm, I'm really not. I'm the person who says to you, I want you to have the best experience ever. That should not involve calling an ambulance. Crown of thorns, I love it. It's beautiful in pictures. I won't ever own one. I am clumsy. And I live under Murphy's Law. I could have a crown of thorns in the uttermost corner of my landscape. I'm bound to fall in it at some point or the other. I wasn't even walking over there. And I will fall into crown of thorns. It's cute, but potted or in the ground, that is a whole bunch of hypodermic needles. And it never feels good. I want you all to think about these things. I don't want you to say, well, I'm going home and I'm going to put in a garden for the pollinators. I want you to put in a garden for you and let the pollinators come. Cater to you. They're going to show up. If you like purple, may I introduce you to my friend called Stokes Aster. I, call, I was raised calling that vervine, but it's called porter weed here. Oh, man. And what the people down in the Keys call the Taurus tree and what you all call gumbo limbo, I grew up calling it red birch. Right? Interesting. But it all means the same thing. It means it's got red scaly trunk. That's what it means. Yes. Oh, yes. It, it grows beautifully. It grows beautifully here. There are two of them over at... Riverview Park in Sebastian. There are several on the island which has the same temperature and climating range of South Florida. And then there are lots of people who grow it inland as well. Yes, the tourist tree, red birch, gumbo limbo, it grows well here. But sometimes assess the things that are already in your landscape, add to those things. Give yourself a break. Most people have oak trees here. Don't fight with your oak tree. Accessorize your oak tree. That's what you want to do. You want to find things that grow in part shade. You want to find things that will grow in full shade. There is a plant for every situation. 
we have master gardeners. I have an email address. I answer it often. Notice I didn't say every day. Because there are some days like today that I finish working here. I drop off everything to the office and I'm like, woo! I go home and I cook and I do homework, right? So I might not answer you every day, but master gardeners, they're in there every single day and they like stumpers. They get points at meetings. They'll say, oh, you'll never imagine what we had in the other day. It was this and guess what it was? A Brahma, blind Brahma snakes, about this big. Little itty bitty things look like worms. I looked at it and everybody was like, oh, that worm. And I'm there like, no, that's a snake. And everybody was like, I, I've never seen a flatworm like this. No, nope, that's a snake. Nikki, it's a snake, people, it's a snake. Pull out my cell phone, zoom in. There are no worms with scales. I said, yep, that's a snake. They, look at the nostrils. They were deader than doornails. They're harmless little itty bitty things that like to grow in containers. They're all over the place. They came in however, when, and whenever, what. They really don't do much of anything but just live there. But they were coming out of the pots and coming in under the door jam. And they were just wiggling about, doing their snaky dance. And the woman was terrified. She thought that this was some sort of worm and it might have had some sort of disease. No, it's a snake. And I told her, I said, here's what you do. You get the dustbin and the broom. Throw them back outside where they belong. That's all. But we have the resources for you to get this done really well under any conditions. So do you all have questions?